Hey, we're going to go through the uh, special relativity notes that have been in class in case you missed it or just want to review something. I'm going to do it kind of fast here. And so this is our whole agenda for all three days. And this is day one video. And so first we talked about Galileo and relativity. Notice no special there. And so Galileo uh, made progress on the ideas of relativity and realize that motion of an object only makes sense when measured relative to another object. There's no absolute motion that tells how an object is really moving. Uh, and so let's say a skilled person can always throw a ball exactly the same at six meters per second relative to himself. He throws it at you while he walks toward you at two meters per second. How fast would that ball be going? Well, he's going toward you, he's throwing it toward you, so you just add him, right? you get eight meters per second. Common sense, that's Galileo's idea of relativity. And a skilled person can always throw the ball at six, but now he's walking away from you at two. And so now he's going, he's throwing it towards you, but walking away from you, so it should come out to be four. Uh, so again, just simple stuff, but there's some neat things, but what would happen if he was running away from you at six meters per second? and he threw the ball the same way. What would that ball do? And we found out by watching the uh, Japanese baseball relative motion video. And we're not gonna watch this whole thing here. So I'm just gonna fast forward to the exciting conclusion. And so it looks like the ball went forward. The, the truck was going 100 kilometers per hour forward. The baseball was shot backwards at 100 kilometers per hour. And so it should have just dropped straight to the ground. It looks like it's going forward, but if you take a closer look, you can see it does fall a little bit forward but that's more to do with the accuracy of their speedometer. And then the ball was spinning, so it looked like it went a lot faster. And so Newton and relativity pretty much adopted Galileo's ideas, believed in absolute space, thought there was a way to measure absolute motion, but it wasn't really a big deal. It just was a comforting idea, more of a philosophy. So what would that be like? Is there a giant Cartesian coordinate system floating in space? What's at the origin? Anything special? Is that maybe the sun, center of the galaxy, God? Uh, again, uh, not an important idea for Newton's physics, but he sort of thought maybe there was something like that. And it turned out that was revived later when the wave theory of light gained favor over Newton's particle theory. One problem with the wave model, they needed a medium. So waves travel through something. Sound waves through air, no air, no sound wave. And so what medium did light waves travel through? They hypothesized something uh, called the ether, something that permeated the universe and was absolutely at rest, and light would travel through it at a constant speed, uh, the speed of light. And so it kind of was like Newton's idea of absolute space. If you could measure um, changes in the speed of light based on your movement through the ether, you could determine your absolute motion. And so the ether was like this substance that permeated all of space, but it had some weird properties. It needed to be a fluid, but more rigid than steel for light to be able to wave it. And attempts to measure its properties kept showing it had very little, if any, properties. In other words, the ether was becoming somewhat ethereal. If you could show it existed, you'd be famous. And two people that tried were Michelson and Morley. And so this is a schematic of their device. So I'm not going to go into it here. I recommend you look up Michelson-Morley experiments. Uh, but they, their apparatus could measure the speed of light very accurately. And so they thought that light traveled at a constant speed through the ether. And so Earth traveled through the ether due to its orbit about the sun plus other motions. And so they should be able to detect changes to the speed of light based on whether the light beam was traveling in the direction of Earth's direction around the sun or opposite to the direction or anywhere in between. So they thought they'd see a variation in the speed of lights 
uh, and it turned out there was no variation. And so this showed there was no ether. And it also gave light this really weird property that no matter how you are moving or how the source of light is moving, you always measure it to go the same speed in a vacuum. This little animation shows what happens with water waves. If you drop a rock in the water, the wave reaches the back of the boat first, then the front of the boat. This is the boat moving through the water. And that's true whether you're in the boats, like the bottom picture, or uh, watching the boat from a fr frame of rest. What's weird is if this was light, uh, from the boat's frame of reference, the waves would reach the front and the back at the same time. That's hard to come up with a way to resolve that. And so physicists pretty much ignored it. There were some that worked on it, but for the most part, they just said, well, maybe they made a mistake. It turns out they didn't. And so if a ball worked this way, it means no matter how you were moving when you throw it, people would always catch it at the same speed. And so light always travels at speed C, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And no matter how the source of light or the observer are moving, and so this is the second postulate of Einstein's theory of special relativity. And the first postulate is that all the laws of physics are the same in an inertial frame of reference, in other words, one that is not accelerating. So here's a little question. Um, this is one of the most often missed questions on the test. If a rock ship's traveling towards you at half the speed of light, it shines a light at you, and you have it go through some device like the Michelson-Morley device to measure its speed, what speed would you measure? And a lot of people think, oh, then it's going to be one and a half. That's not true. It's always one. If I changed it on the test so the rocket ship's traveling away from you, the answer is still one. And so that is hard to uh, reconcile with our everyday motion of the relativity of motion of objects. Light is special. And so the second postulate of relativity, according to Calvin, let's go through this. So he's at least hoping it's true as his mother tries to catch up with Calvin, the human light particle. Uh, so ordinary objects don't work like light. And so here's a little demonstration with uh, relativity of motion. So I toss my marker straight up in the air while I'm standing in front of you. We all see it go the same distance in the same time, and we'd all measure the same average distance. But if I walk past you, you see the marker go in a parabola where I still see it just go up and down. And so now you would say it has a greater average speed because you got, saw it go through more distance in the same time. But light doesn't work that way. If we did that experiment with light, we'd both measure the same speed. Something's got to be different. Speed is distance over time or space over time, and that is a constant. And so if the speed of light is a constant, you change how you move through space, you change how you move through time. Space and time are connected, sometimes called space-time. And so speed is space over time. If speed is a constant, if you uh, measure light traveling through more space, uh, so what about the time? You would measure more time. And so this results in something called time dilation. Dilation: A person moving relative to you measures less time. Their clocks and metabolism run slower, so biological clocks. So that's why teachers always move around the room, so their clock goes slower, and they age less than you. But that's not really true because the effect is very, very tiny. Uh, but it is important. If GPS uh, navigation software did not include time dilation in it, it wouldn't work very well. You could figure out what city you're in, but definitely not what street and which way to turn. And so we then took a field trip into the future, and now we're in the future, back when we took it in class. In other words, you're always traveling into the future. Uh, what we're saying is you can change the rate at which you can travel into the future. And then we watched a short video on an airplane that flew across the Atlantic, and the clock in the airplane uh, measured less time than the reference clock that stayed on the ground. We won't do the video here.
And we talked about uses of time dilation. If you had a rocket ship that could go near the speed of light, maybe if you had a terminal illness, you would take a one-year trip and come back to Earth in 50 years and they could cure your illness, or maybe they'd just throw you in quarantine. Always a risk, but I think some people would want to experience the future. But remember, it's a one-way trip. And so let's put this into a little context. Uh, here's a quote from uh, Michelson, from the Michelson-Morley experiments, uh, pretty much saying he thought physics was done. And so that was a common perception. Not everybody felt that way, but it was a common perception at the start of the 20th century, which is when Einstein was about to publish his paper on special relativity. So there's just a little analogy. The laws of physics are well regarded, like this well-built house. But there's just one problem. The Michelson-Morley result is hard to explain. There were other problems. Uh, ultraviolet catastrophe, another one. Look that up. Uh, but let's stick with our subject. Michelson-Morley is like a sticking door. And most physicists ignored it. Laws of physics were working great. Just forget about the sticking door. Others tried to fix it. Lorentz, by analogy, tried to sand the door jam. Poincaré planed the door. Made progress, the door still stuck. So we needed Einstein to fix the sticking door. He did something a little unconventional, which would be equivalent to bulldozing down the house. Uh, his ideas that incorporated the results of the Michelson-Morley experiment into physics changed their concepts of space, time, mass, and energy. So this is the light clock experiment. It is in the book, so I'm just going to go really fast. We're going to have this clock zoom past us at speed V. And we saw the clock go a distance Vt, just distance, this distance is speed times time. And we saw the light pulse move also speed times time, but the speed now is C, speed of light times the time. What about somebody moving with the clock? They saw it go through this distance, and C is still the same. It's light. It's always traveling at speed C. We don't figure out some new speed for light. We have a different time. And this time would have to be less, because this distance is less. And if only there was some way to connect these three distances. And we know there is the Agrian theorem. And again, this is all in the book. You can go through this and solve for t in terms of t naught, v, and c. And you get that. And so if you put in your speed and how much time you're going to be gone, it'll tell you how much time people at rest relative to you experienced. Uh, this is a graph of it, and you can see that at low speeds, hardly any effect, but as you approach the speed of light, it becomes more and more, and this shoots up asymptotically approaching one, never reaching there, uh, and the time dilation factor can go into thousands if you could go that fast. And so here's a quick example, a spaceship traveling one hour away from Earth and then returning in, uh, in two hours according to the ship clock, how much time would Earth have experienced? So T is what we want to solve for. T naught is two hours. Speed is 0.6 C. So we put it in terms of the speed of light. So we put it in that equation. The C's cancel. Otherwise, you'd have to have the speed of light meters per second. And this in meters per second or whatever the units are, as long as they're the same. Our answer comes out to two and a half hours. And so it is a significant time dilation at this speed. But keep in mind, we have no rocket ships that go anywhere near the speed, but there are atomic particles that go way faster than this, and their decay times are varied by the exact predicted amount. And then atomic clocks can measure very, very tiny uh, time dilation factors. And so this has been shown experimentally to be a fact over and over again. And we just did this little cartoon. I'll just flip through it here. You can pause and read it if you want. And so the message is our perception of time passing is different too, right? Time flies when you're having fun. And also it looks like time, uh, your perception of time passing changes with age, probably having something to do with what fraction the unit of time is compared to your lifetime. So little kids... Summer is a long time. It's a large fraction of their lifetime.
And then we did this little cartoon on the twin trip. I might post this separately, but it's all in your book. And then we did that. And so the twin trip, the uh, paradox in the twin paradox is if one trip, if one twin is moving relative to the Earth, Earth sees their clock going slow, but that twin would see the Earth's clock going slow. And so both clocks going slow, how come one ages more than the other? One of the twins accelerated. And general relativity says it's that twin that's going to be the one that doesn't age as much. And so during that acceleration, that twin would see the Earth's clock going fast. But when they're just moving and not accelerating, the moving clock, you see, always goes slower. And then we did this Einstein dream example. 